First, would like to introduce to you Sarah Little, PhD. Sarah is a toxics use reduction consultant and former pesticide awareness coordinator for the town of Wellesley, Massachusetts. She is the author of Introduction to Organic Lawns and Yards, a quick start guide for homeowners. Sarah has worked in pesticide use reduction with the Wellesley Cancer Prevention Project, the Toxic Use Reduction Institute, and the Northeast Organic Farming Association's Organic Landscaping Training Program for over 10 years. She was the editor for the NOFA Standards for Organic Lawn Land Care, Practices for Design and Maintenance of Ecological Landscapes, and the NOFA Organic Lawn and Turf Handbook. She has a lush organic yards and grows vegetables in raised beds. So what we're going to hear is about 10 minutes. It's going to be sort of a whirlwind, uh, 10 minutes from everybody, and then we're going to try to get some give and take and exchange with questions that you can ask you know, folks that you know, maybe have been there and, and, and sort of done that. Sarah. Um, hi, so I'm from Wellesley, Massachusetts, and I've been working on pesticide use reduction for about 12 years. Uh, as, an, as an advocate, I'm not a landscaper. And I originally started out because I had small kids and there was pellets on the neighbor's lawn and sidewalk and I wondered what they were and I started Googling it and I found out this stuff was poisonous and probably not good for my two-year-old. So um, one thing led to another and I, I took a job with the town. They had a part-time pesticide awareness coordinator and I got some grants from the Toxics Use Reduction Institute and we did a town-wide pesticide awareness campaign that was very successful and a lot of other towns were interested in duplicating it so I got a second grant to do a regional training. And I'm just gonna, what I'm gonna do is kind of, when I say notes from the field, this is just a summary of kind of 12 years of experience of, of flogging this horse uh, and what my lessons I've learned. But I'll give you a little bit of background of what I've done and how I learned these lessons. So when I, when I did the, the first grant, I put together a, I mean the regional training, I put together a resource guide for citizens or individuals who wanted to get their town to adopt um, pesticide use reduction strategies. And so I, I produced a, a guide with all kinds of resources they could take to their um, town managers and convince them to do something about it. And, this was uh, distributed to all the towns in Massachusetts, and there were, at the time, this was maybe eight years ago, there were probably around 50 towns who were interested in doing a pesticide reduction efforts at some level. Um, and then I realized that if you ask people to not use pesticides, which is what, what I was concerned about, you have to give them an alternative, and there weren't very many alternatives available. Um, and so I heard about and got involved with a group at the Northeast Organic Farming Association that was working on an organic landscaping training program. And they uh, put together a five-day course and an accreditation program and began training and accrediting organic landscapers. And so I, I worked with them for over 10 years and one of the things that we produced was an uh, organic lawn and turf handbook. Um, for professionals, and also a critical is the, is what is organic lawn care, uh, organic landscaping, um, which is organic land care for non-agricultural lands. And so this group wrote the first standards, and we update them every couple of years. And the and uh, I was the editor of the most recent revision. Um, and you can buy these online, and it's a definition that's very similar to the national organic standards, but slightly modified to apply to landscapes. So this is the, the standards by which all the accredited landscapers work. And the program has about 600 accredited landscapers, most of them in the Northeast and the bulk of them in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And there's a searchable database for anybody who wants to find an organic landscaper and they're looking for a specific um, topics and I have a little postcard here with our website if anybody wants that you can get that later um, So how do I do a, get my next slide? <laughs> this thing okay so, Okay, so we train organic landscapers to do all kinds of landscaping organically, but I'm gonna focus on lawns because I think as a pesticide 
uh, reduction advocate, this is the biggest problem with the public's interface with pesticides is on lawns. Um, so I did, we did the, uh, a project with the Long Island Sound Futures Fund uh, through the Connecticut NOFA, which houses the Organic Land Care Program. And so we were doing some calculations of pesticide use. And if you follow like Scott's four steps directions and you calculate uh, how much, based, we did some surveys of how many people use conventional and how many people use organic and you do some calculations, you can find out that annually the state of Connecticut puts about 400,000 pounds of pesticides into Long Island Sound and 14 million pounds of synthetic nitrogen and uses 7 billion gallons of water on their lawns. So this is a big resource issue, lawns. Um, we are asking people to change their habits and this is kind of where I've ended up after 12 years of work. When I started out, I thought, you know, I'll tell people this stuff's poisonous, they'll stop using it, it'll take me a year, that'll be the end of it, okay? It doesn't work for a number of reasons. Um, it turns out we're actually asking them, people, to change the, a lot of their behaviors. And I've listed here as sort of my concise <coughs> 10 points of an organic lawn, or is to do all these different things. Not using pesticides is just one of this 10. Um, all these are important from an environmental perspective. Um, so I have observed people's attitudes, uh, particularly when after a year people were still using pesticides and I said, why are they still using them? I told them they were poisonous. But people really care about their lawn. They are very concerned. They have their egos tied up with their lawn, seriously tied up. I had one guy say, it's like my necktie. It's the first thing people see and they make their judgment of me based on it. So um, people are not comfortable with nature. They're afraid of bugs and they hate weeds. And this is a, I don't know if it's a fact, it's a cultural fact here. They don't know about pesticides. If we did a survey and Something like 25, at least 25% of the people said they didn't use pesticides but listed a product that had pesticides in it. So they don't even know they're using them. Um, and I also had a booth, a, a tent that said pesticide awareness campaign. And I would set it up at different events and people would actually avoid it. You know, I would be in the straight line between one, you know, the cookie table and the, the kitty you know, face painting, and people would make a big circle around it so they didn't have to go through my tent. Okay, so they don't want to know. They're actively avoiding the information. They don't like to change. We're all like that. Um, they prefer material solutions to method solutions. It's much easier to take a pill than to, than to uh, go running, for instance. They like mainstream solutions. They don't like a a fringe solution, and they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to manage their lawns. So I've also observed that for lawns, clover is really important. And one of the ways you can divide people into two groups, those who think clover is a weed and those who don't. And it's important to do that because the way you approach these people is very different. Clover is great for lawns. It didn't used to be a weed until we developed broadleafed herbicides and became a weed. So there are clover lovers and clover haters. And um, so we need to say, okay, so if we want to make a change, we have those two kinds of people. And how do you serve them? They're different. So if there, you have people who say uh, clover isn't a weed, clover's, clover's great, they, um, it's mainly they, they have a knowledge barrier and it's just a question of educating them. And I recently, with a grant from the USDA, produced this booklet on, uh, for homeowners on, it's like a quick start guide for organic landscaping and it's available on our website for purchase if you want to distribute it. These are searches on our database on our, for landscapers. There's a lot of people looking for organic landscapers. There's a lot of clover lovers out there. But then there are the people who think clover is a weed. They're really different. They're a much harder group to, uh, to get to, to reach. And there's a study in Canada that suggests that you will not reach them without regulation. Um, so this is my final slide. So for those people, you need laws, policies, public pressure. So how do you get laws and policies? So my town, I we managed to get a, an, uh, 
we call it an integrated pest management policy. This is a big topic of discussion, but it is an organic pest management policy, but integrated pest management is a much more acceptable term. So we called it that, but if you read it, it doesn't allow chemical pests, synthetic chemicals. Um, so you're going to get resistant. The, the red is the people who are going to fight it, and the, the blue is the people who will help you. And so um, you can read that. But the important thing is to have somebody in town who's employed by the town or an elected official who's your advocate, and also to have people who know how to do it. You have to have some local landscapers who can do it. And at the state level, similar division and it's really important to have um, support from organic landscaping businesses, and that's one thing we don't have right now. We don't have an organized organic landscaping business for, for state-level policy uh, efforts. And that's it. So now I'm going to bring, you know, to you someone from New Jersey, uh, a ball of fire, you know, someone that has, you know, certainly not done this alone, but with colleagues in New Jersey is trying to replicate what Patty and Doug Wood did in New York, uh, you know, what the folks did here in Connecticut, and take that same fight, um, fight to New Jersey. Started off at the local level, still very active at the local level, and then has expanded that to uh, to include statewide effort. Suzanne Atman is director of the Northern New Jersey Safe Yards Alliance, originally founded by residents concerned about the widespread use of synthetic lawn pesticides in Northern New Jersey. They work actively to influence legislative change, including helping to lead efforts to pass the Safe Playing Fields Act organize events, produce educational materials, and spearhead campaigns to build awareness and change behavior. Their Safe Yards Challenge asks residents to help inspire chemical-free yard care changes by taking a stand to raise awareness and educate neighbors. Suzanne is on Montclair's green team and recently completed ANJEC's Leading Green Program in Environmental Leadership. Suzanne. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I do have a video clip at the end for, for all of you who need to have your multimedia as part of this. Um, so I got involved in this um, because of my kids. I had two boys under four, and I was doing everything I could, as, as everybody else in this panel is, 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 is trying to do, to keep my home safe and healthy. Um, and then I discovered this lawn chemical issue, and it really did propel me into that collective action, that political action that Sandra was speaking about last night. Um, I think part of it was that I realized with all these chemicals that we couldn't control, um, that this was something we could control. We could simply stop, and there are safer alternatives. So um, it's amazing the, the kind of warrior energy you discover within yourself as a mom. And, and what first got me started was similar to, to many of us is I moved from Brooklyn, which is a lawn-free place, to Montclair, New Jersey. And within the first week of getting there, I walked outside and I looked at my neighbor's lawn to the left and to the right and to the left and across the street. And there were these poison signs. And I thought, oh my god, are, you know, are there snakes in the grass? Or, Scorpions? Is there toxic gas coming up from the ground? What, what's going on here? And I did the research and couldn't believe that this was happening all around me. Um, and so that's how it began. And I was lucky enough to find a group of other people who were also thinking similar thoughts. And what was missing in our town, which tends to be a very progressive town, was an organized effort to do something about this. And so that's where we realized we, we had the passion and the will to take that stand. Um, and so we just started by doing anecdotal research, not as, as thorough as Sarah did, and discovered similar things, that there were homeowners who really were on the cusp of making that change to organics, uh, but just needed to be asked, and just needed to, um, to, to uh, understand what their alternatives were. Then there were the homeowners who 
um, just didn't believe that it was bad, and, and mostly because their landscapers had a wonderful story for why these chemicals aren't bad. Once, once they're dry, everything's fine, and everybody wants to trust the professionals that they hire. Um, and then there, there, there were the homeowners who, um, uh, who just needed to know what the, or, or I, I should say they, where these lawn chemicals or having the perfect lawn was a vice. It, you know, I, I remember we knocked on a door when we were doing some campaigning and the person kind of looked through the window and said, I know, I know I shouldn't use them, but I use them sometimes, you know. So, and this person happened to be an environmentalist. So it's, it seems to be a vice for certain people. Um, and then we talked to landscapers because we realized this had to be, we had to talk to all the stakeholders and there were landscapers who, um, wanted to learn more about organics, didn't know how to go about it. New Jersey, unfortunately, doesn't still have great organic training for landscapers. Um, and then there were landscapers we talked to who said, I don't want to use pesticides, but the homeowners want, they want this perfect manicured lawn. What am I going to do? You know, and so that was great, though. It was inspiring to hear that there were landscapers who, you know, if we could then focus on the homeowner side of it, it was like making a deal with them, then they could go learn the organic side of it. So that was hopeful. Um, so when we were thinking about our strategy, and we did spend a lot of time strategizing. Um, I tend to do that too much. But um, we realized there was two approaches, this grassroots approach of homeowner education, one yard at a time, and that actually became our, our tagline. Um, and then there's the other approach, which is to just remove the possibility altogether. Just remove the product possibility altogether, what Canada has done. Um, and we knew that we were too small to really take that on, um, you know, legislatively, or get these products off the shelves, but we wanted to infuse all the work we were doing with something that would lead in that direction. So we started to bring petitions to all of our events um, you know, these, these petitions for um, overturning the preemption law, knowing it wouldn't happen right away, but one day it would, and we would have all these petitions signed. So we started to infuse our work with that. And one of the first things we did was to um, create our own website and our own logo. While we don't want to recreate the, world, the, the wheel, you know, Beyond Pesticides has incredible information, and you could just point people in that direction. We also thought it was important to, to tailor it to our community so that people could really feel like they're part of something. Sometimes when things are too big, you don't feel like you can make a difference. Um, so luckily, we had some people in our group who had the skills to do that, and, and that was a great success. It also said to the community, here we are taking an organized stand, so we can now be your resource. Um, we thought about how we were going to approach different homeowners, and, and on, on one end, we we called people the, the supporters. Those are the people who already were organic. On the other end were the, um, we called them the people who were stuck in their ways in a, on a good day. We had you know, worse names for them. And then in between were the people who were, you know, we called them low-hanging fruit, who were ready to be converted. And so in year one, we went out and did an education campaign. We, we were lucky to have a group of canvassers in our community who distributed 4,000 flyers to to homes, um, we held a big educational seminar. Uh, we, t you know, tabled at local events. We started speaking at different community events. All the things everybody's talked about. Um, and then in the second year, we um, we decided to focus more on the supporters and try to turn them into advocates, so that it wasn't just us doing it, but it was everybody doing it, who, who wanted to have a voice. We found there was a lot of pain around this issue and people needed to have a voice. Um, and so we created this Safe Yards Challenge and, and it was, uh, the challenge is to find a way to educate one neighbor or educate your school, you know, or educate whatever your circle of influence it is. And we found that those ladybug pesticide free zones uh, signs are very helpful um, as a way to get that going. I can talk more offline about how we did that. Um, and so along the way, as, as part of trying to build something, um, you know, I talked to a lot of the leaders in this movement. Um, I talked to, um, to Beyond Pesticides, I talked to Paul Tukey, I talked to Grassroots in New York, um, and I'll get to Chip in a moment. Um, and I also talked to the New Jersey Environmental Federation, which is the largest environmental federation in New Jersey. 
and um, built kind of an educa uh, educator and advisor with um, the woman there who's Jane Nagaki who had been working on pesticide issues for 20 years in New Jersey and helped to spearhead the effort to get 40 towns to go pesticide free on their public parks. So I was really lucky to have her. Um, and <clears throat> along the way, we heard about this legislation that uh, was introduced, the Safe Playing Fields Act, and we both looked at each other and said, what can we do? Um, and, and that's kind of how it started. I happened to be in the right place um, um, with somebody who, an organization that really wanted to take this on, um, and, and I was playing the role of that citizen activist, the citizen advocate that, they, that we need to have in every legislative effort. It's not just those federations, but you need that. Um, and so that's when the journey began. Um, and so this, this legislation is, is needed in New Jersey because in 2002, they passed the School Integrated Pest Management Act. So New Jersey was kind of progressive in that sense. They wanted to reduce pesticides because of the link to health problems. Um, and they passed it indoors and outdoors. And so over the years, they found that indoors, we found it works, like we've been talking about for the past day, but outdoors, it doesn't. Two, I, um, I was at a meeting recently with somebody from the DEP, or Department of Environmental Protection, and he said very clearly, when I go to some of these schools and I see that they use Roundup, and I say, why did you use Roundup? And they say, oh, because it just said I have to consider it using the other things first. You know, and so they considered it, <laughs> and then they used it. They considered not doing it, and then they used it. Um, and so there's just no teeth in it. You can't monitor it. You can't regulate it. Um, and, and, and so you know all about that. So what, what this law does is it's a ban. It's a clear mandate that you don't use these synthetic pesticides, toxic pesticides, for turf management, except in the case of a public health emergency, as um, Patty explained. Um, so the, the journey began with a petition, which has been really helpful as a way to see who in the state of New Jersey was interested in this issue. It was a viral petition, and it's wonderful because now we have this, we have this database of people who care about this issue, and whenever we need to do an action alert, there they are. Um, we found people to testify. We found about 30 people from the health side to the children's advocacy side. Um, to the parent side, to the local official side. And, and these people, a lot of them didn't come testify, but they wrote letters, so it's always important to get those letters from, from those people. Um, then we did our own testimonies and, and um, worked, started to build a coalition. The Junior League got involved, and somebody was talking before about how important it is to build a coalition with people you wouldn't normally be in bed together. So you know, here was the Environmental Federation and the Junior League doing something together, which was really really good for something that we wanted to be considered a bipartisan bill. Um, and um, so I guess I'll give you just some of my lessons learned so far along the way. Uh, this bill is in progress. It's, 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 it's doing very well um, and it's, it's in process and I'm happy to talk to people offline more about it. Um, but um, what I would say is one, if you're gonna go about this, find sponsors who are passionate really passionate about this cause. They're not doing it just because it sounds good or because somebody told them to. And, and sponsors who can articulate the message. Um, make it a bipartisan uh, bill, and, and this kind of legislation can be bipartisan. It's amazing how many Republicans have come out and supported this, even conservative Republicans, so find, find um, positivity in that. Um, know your arguments and know the opposite side's arguments before you start this process so that you can rebut those arguments proactively. Um, if you don't have money, um, um, that's okay because with this kind of legislation, at the end of the day, it's about inspiring the grassroots. The chemical industry has deep pockets, so we can't fight them on that. But what we can do is get tons of parents and, and grassroots people out and, and making, making a fuss. Uh, remember the message, this kind of bill is about children's health. As much as it does help the environment, it's a children's health bill. And if that's the message you bring forward, you'll, you'll really will get the bipartisan support and you'll see people coming out of the woodwork. Um, educate, simplify your message. Legislators do not have time, so you have to find a way to educate 
don't give up on the opposition. Uh, we had the New Jersey Principals Association came out um, in opposition of the bill, and then uh, a year later, they're now supporting it, so don't give up on those groups. Uh, find ways to educate through the media, uh, press conferences, letters to the editor, um, and reach out to those who've gone before you, so Nancy Alderman, Grassroots. So I'm just gonna show you a two minute video clip from a, oops, from, where's the mouse? Oh, right, thank you. This was a press conference we had last week. Um, we found an opportunity with a college that was going organic, and it was a good opportunity for us to kind of pitch the Safe Playing Fields Act. So look for those opportunities and throw a press conference together. The fields are going to make greener at Bergen Community College. Officials gathered Friday in Paramus to announce the school's next step in demonstrating its commitment to environmental protection, sustainability, and public health. This is the first year we're going all natural turf care on our playing fields. We're doing this because we have a concern for our students. We have been guilty of using pesticides here, but we're changing our ways. The students wanted to start a sort of green team program to do more uh, work on campus. Uh, we were all very excited about that. The administration and faculty got behind them. And, and it was really a student-led um, project. This move supports a comparable statewide effort called the Safe Playing Fields Act that calls for the restriction of toxic synthetic lawn pesticides. Big increase in childhood <coughs> asthma, both cancer and asthma have been linked in the literature to these chemicals. We thought that it was important to, to regulate their application in places where it children will come in contact with them. I hope that when people come here and notice how good their fields are, that they will say, you know what, we need to do the same thing. So it always takes somebody to t step out of the box, and Bergen Community has always been there to do that. When you hear the word green, you might think expensive, but officials say looking forward, it won't be at all. With organics, the cost initially might be more expensive because you're trying to stimulate that life in the soil which has been suppressed. But over time, it's been proven that your costs go down. We don't do it unless it's going to save the college money. Almost all the time, within a year, we get our investment back. That's always in the calculation. In Paramus, Agnes Chuck for your New Jersey News Now on New York One. And we're um, going to bring up Sue Phelan. Um, I've worked with Sue for, uh, Sue goes back into the activist years along with her husband, Steve Seymour, who's out there, need to recognize they're kind of a, kind of a team. They, they come together along with other people on Cape Cod, um, but for a number of years have been doing uh, tremendous things. And, and all of a sudden, the benefits and, and reaping some of the successes um, after a lot of years, you've heard multiple times today that those of us in the world of uh, pesticide reduction and elimination are persistent. Uh, we're in it for the long term. It, it's not an easy thing. The two of them have been in it for the long term, uh, and, and now it, uh, it really shows. Sue Phelan is director of a Cape-based grassroots nonprofit, Green Cape, a group founded 14 years ago by a group of neighbors concerned about the indiscriminate use of pesticides. The current focus of Green Cape activities is the promotion of organ land, organic land management and halting the spraying of five herbicides over the Cape's only drinking water supply. Sue has been an active organic gardener for 42 years and after moving to Cape Cod, became a backyard beekeeper 24 years ago. She is a DOFA Mass member and a board member of the Alliance for a Healthy Tomorrow and Clean, Action, uh, Clean Water Action, Massachusetts. Sue. Lights are strong. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm so glad to have been invited here. Um, I was asked to discuss local and uh, regional policies and possibly regulations. I, I can really only speak to what's, what's been happening on the Cape lately. Um, and I think each town is unique, but there are also some, some things you can take away if you're interested in promoting the same types of initiatives in your town. Um, let's see. Oh, it works. 
Okay, so Green Cape really only focuses uh, on the 15 <laughs> towns on the Cape. Um, but we do partner with a lot of other groups and off Cape. Um, and let me see if this works. It does. Wellfleet. Um, earlier this month, the town of Wellfleet adopted an organic land management policy for their town properties, um, only for their town properties because of the Massachusetts pesticide preemption law. Um, and this uh, policy was crafted by, mostly by Chip Osborne, it's based on the Marblehead model. This is the first town on the Cape to adopt such a policy, and I think only the second in Massachusetts. Marblehead, of course, being primo. Um, while this seemingly only took a few months, I mean, I approached the town administrator in Wellfleet in December, but don't let that fool you. Um, we've really been working toward this type of uh, thing for about 14 years, as long as our organization has been in existence. So there are just a few things. First, let's give Wellfleet their due. And I have to say, if you go on the Wellfleet website, there's a whole section just on pesticides on, on the front page of their website. It's very cool. Here's a few things that helped us achieve this surprising success. We learned uh, it's OK to ask for help. And I oh, went back here a little bit. Um, from our very beginnings in 1998, we kind of relied on other bigger groups off Cape, like Clean Water Action, seen here, um, and also Toxics Action has been um, really an amazing um, partnership. It's really moved us forward so much faster. When all of the environmental groups on the Cape, none of them wanted, we don't have pesticides on our agenda. Um, they did not want to even talk about the pesticide issue. So since we didn't really feel like we had the expertise at that point, um, we went off Cape. And I think everyone can really take advantage of, of that. We did our homework. Um, this is actually slide, these are actually fairly recent slides. Um, we worked with Toxics Action in a group called Green Corps out of Boston. Um, it's critical to have uh, accurate and properly sourced uh, information about pesticides uh, just in case uh, town officials and need convincing that in fact um, pesticides and synthetic chemical fertilizers do have health and environmental impacts because they haven't been coming to these uh, forums. Uh, you can also always tap into these, these resources. Um, but, and I think actually, that's more, more plotting and scheming. Okay, we used Beyond Pesticides before it was even called that um, as a major source of our early um, research on pesticides. So we're really quite indebted to them and they have a massive website. Um, we also, um, created a groundwork and, and laid the network for change ahead of time. Now, I don't think you necessarily have to do it ahead of time, but it really does need to be done. I don't think people, officials respond to like a single person coming and complaining about lawn care. It helps develop um, a nose for team players and um, in, in my case, I think it's helpful to have a lot of these gregarious people um, working with you. It's first of all, it's just more fun and secondly, uh, they all know people that you don't know so you expand uh, your network exponentially. Okay, um, well, you can preach to the choir. It just does create a larger choir eventually and those people know more people. This is um, us very recently getting um, an award from the Senate from Senator Wolf. Um, I'm sure like two years ago, he wouldn't have answered our phone calls. Um, so Green Cape's earlier efforts, like we did a school pesticide use survey based on EHHI's model 
Um, and we published that. We've also done, let's see, this should be first. Uh, we tested about 16 arsenic-treated playsets around the Cape, public playsets, and um, this one was particularly horrendous in the amount of arsenic that it was leaching, and it was part of the, a larger program, a national program, uh, with the Environmental Working Group. Um, so in doing some of these projects, we got more members and we got a lot more moms on board, of course, which is always important for your network. We've always provided um, films, informative films, and then we have post-film discussions, which are invariably around pesticides. Uh, we did this about 16 times on the Cape last year and a half. And then we've created some materials specifically about uh, lawn brochures, about lawn care. We've uh, always supported organic farming and we're members as a, as a group of, of NOFA as well. And we always have organic gardening and lawn care seminars. More recently, our, um, our focus on educating the homeowner, which has really been our primary focus for 14 years, it's shifted as we campaigned uh, successfully, I might add, in all 15 Cape Towns for the passage of non-binding resolutions opposing the Public Utilities NSTAR uh, right-of-way spraying um, over, this is the actual D EPA designated sole source aquifer map. Our aquifer is like the whole 15 towns and there's no way around it. We don't have a pipeline to Quabbin. You mess this up, you're done. So NSTAR is gonna be spraying five herbicides, they think, on uh, throughout this uh, about 150 miles. And they're also spraying on private property without consent, and you can see how close these play sets are to the power easements. Because of this, um, we were able to activate like thousands of Cape residents and tourists just on this one issue alone. Um, we got about 200 businesses, local businesses, to sign uh, also in opposition and about 100 uh, health professionals and scientists writing letters to the, oh my goodness, two minutes, okay, to the CEO. So I just want to note that Barnstable has not, the town of Barnstable has not signed our policy yet, but their lawns are organic already, so we're well on the way to that discussion. Sometimes you just have to sit outside town hall for years. The trust but verify thing has to do with uh, the towns telling us, oh, we're already organic, you know, you know that. Um, and I think you've all seen that before. We were able to get, uh, because we live in, in New England, we are able to get NOFA to do trainings and we were very, very lucky to be able to do a municipal land care training for all of the municipal workers at the Barnstable Town Hall in November and courtesy of Chip Osborne, who has been very generous with his time on the Cape for, for us. Um, as I said, like March 13th, uh, the town of uh, Wellfleet passed a policy. It was based very strongly on the Marblehead policy. We did a very few adjustments. We did not take anything out. Um, and I would suggest if you're gonna be doing policies in your town that you use this policy. It's right on their website. So on the March 13th, the Wellfleet Board of Selectmen unanimously, I may add, passed the policy and is handing it off to the Board of Health for a regulation. Um, so with fingers crossed and a lot of hard work, I think we're gonna try to get more Cape Towns to pass the policy and, uh, and hope that it goes off Cape as well. Off Cape and beyond. Thank you. Jeffrey Cordillac has been involved with ex ex environmental education for 15, greater than 15 years through his work with Audubon and developing the Audubon at Home initiative in Greenwich. 
He has been encouraging people to make more eco-friendly consumer choices and learning wildlife-friendly landscaping practices. In doing so, he has hosted dozens of events about green building and energy initiatives, the organic food revolution, organic lawn care, and other topics related to international bird conservation. As an active member of the conservation community, Jeff can assist with raising awareness of environmental issues, conserving biodiversity, and generating sustainable approaches for urban living and natural resource protection. Jeff. Well, thank you for inviting me here today. That's in large part due to uh, Chip's uh, work with us. Um, I'm very proud to be a part of the conference and a part of the National Audubon Society. Um, that is the great egret in its natural habitat. That's what it looks like. Uh, many of you know about Audubon, and we're the bird people, and we certainly are. Um, and I work for Audubon, Connecticut, which is the state office of the National Audubon Society. And people ask, well, well, you're into birds. What's with the food? What's with the lawns? And the answer really is, is that the birds need the insects, and they visit crops, and they have so much. Uh, they're kind of like... Uh, you know, indicator species, the canary in the coal mine. When something's wrong with a bird, you know something's really wrong. Um, and I work out of the Greenwich location. Uh, it's not your typical nature center, as you can see. Uh, it uh, is nature center Greenwich style, and it's a lovely building. It's very green. Uh, it has an art gallery and a store, and it's a good place for me to host programs. And that's what I'm here to talk about. Uh, this is what an office is like there. People go hiking at lunch. We teach lots of kids. And uh, we have a hawk lawn. This is Hawk Watch Lawn. That's a freedom lawn. Uh, there's zero chemicals used on that lawn, never has. Uh, that's because we're cheap. Uh, <laughs> we, we sit on that lawn from August to November. We count birds. We count about 20,000 birds every fall. Uh, they're raptors, really, I should say. Raptors migrating south. Uh, it's quite a place. I hope you can come by and visit sometime. Uh, and this is what it looks like now, springtime at Audubon in Greenwich. That is the first education center for the National Audubon Society. Started in 1942. This was the first place they ever decided to not only protect land, but bring people and teach them. So it's a very unique history. We do two types of events there. Uh, I don't know if this is the right terminology, but type A, type B events. I'm not sure. But that's what I had. Bird walks, the standard nature center thing. Uh, we like to get people out learning about the incredible things out there, teaching them about the frogs that would be affected by chemicals. But we don't mention the chemicals. We just teach them the wonders of nature and get them excited. Our mission is to connect people with nature or reconnect them so they can discover things to take action on. But then there's the type B events, lectures, films, panel discussions, and I kind of like potluck dinners. We do nice ones. Um, the, the part I want to talk to you about is our Audubon Home Initiative, where we're trying to raise awareness. I'm kind of in the awareness raising business. At least I imagine myself to be raising awareness. Sometimes I wonder. Um, but uh, before 2005, it was mainly about bird-friendly landscaping, pesticide reduction. Audubon's been involved in that for a long time. But in Greenwich, uh, with Christy Penoyer's inspiration and, and dedication to the topic of lawns, she started scheduling organic lawn programs. And they were popular, very popular. And then we started adding on new topics that you could see here. Uh, this is um, our site where, uh, with the green lawn in front. That's our, I guess you could say, well-kept lawn. We actually do stuff to that. We, we give it compost tea, we give it seed, we go and hand weed it, we take care of that little strip out front because that's our demonstration site. Uh, that's the, dem the demonstration site for perfect lawns. See, we're in Greenwich and we have a lot of picky people. They really want to have a nice lawn, so we gave them an example. Yes, you could do organic and you could do it like this, and believe me, it's a nice lawn. Next to it on the left, of course, is the Freedom Lawn of Hawk Watch Lawn. Both are great and they're both thriving. Sometimes I think the Freedom Lawn's doing a little better, actually. 
uh, because nature's just doing its thing. In front of the building, it was disturbed soil, it's construction debris that we're trying to bring life back into. So that's why I think it's doing better. Um, what we developed for, uh, to support the ideas of organic lawn care in, in the Greenwich area uh, were basically uh, some signage. We wanted to get something out there. A lot of people come hiking. They don't come to our programs always. So we put signs out. We put them right where they're going to walk by and made them very obvious. And we also put out other ones saying, like, take the organic pledge and, and other things, explaining some of the challenges. And then we just developed an information kiosk. It started with a single flyer, and then it went on to more flyers and more flyers. And this is the point where I really want to thank everybody out there in the expert community. All of you people are working on topics and feeding information. I use all of that information. I put them into new uh, handouts, or I just use the ones you all create. It's very helpful, and I encourage you to all keep doing that uh, without all that expert advice coming in, it would be very hard to convince people uh, to, to make a change like this. Uh, some of the books we like, uh, sorry for the terrible picture, but uh, the Audubon Society Guide to Attracting Birds by Steve Kress is a great way to get people, uh, without even talking about pesticides yet, just start talking to people about, hey, you can, you can make your yard more bird friendly. You like this bird, that bird, we can bring them in. So we're connecting people to nature. And then once they're into that, and then we say, oh, and by the way, be careful with those lawn products. And they say, what do you mean? Well, you might want to do organic. And we refer them to the Turf Handbook and those wonderful organic standards. Thank you very much for working so hard in creating those. NOFA has done something groundbreaking and of nationwide importance. Before their work to write the standards for land care, there were no standards. And there was no information for a regular guy to go look for. Um, then the, the next most important piece was working with the public in lecture format. Uh, CHIP has brought a lot of attention to the center and to Audubon working on, on lawns. I highly recommend, if you haven't invited them to your community, try to do that. It will make a big difference. And uh, how you might want to do that, I have some, some, some thoughts. Um, the target audiences for lawns that we were looking at is the homeowners, the public, um, but also we wanted to target specifically landscapers and specifically golf course managers and club leadership like the members, and specifically the school grounds, the people that do the grounds and the people that manage the people that do the grounds at school. Uh, and then just the general legislature and the public. So different topics, and they were different presentations. They were different events. It was organic lawn care for professionals, for golf club managers, for landscapers. When we did landscapers, we'd have 80, 110 landscapers in our, in our lecture hall. When we did um, golf courses, we maybe had like 25. But believe me, that was an important 25. There's only so many golf clubs to go around, sometimes too many, but we had very important people there for golf club management, and it made a change, and I'm sure it did, because in Greenwich, the Round Hill Club, a very fancy place, completely has gone organic, completely changed everything. Senator Blumenthal and all of them know about it, and other courses are taking the same path. Um, I encourage you to do public programs, and when you're gonna do one, make it worth it. Every time I have a challenge getting crowds out, right, that's, that's the, the challenge. So here are some ideas. Uh, some of this is obvious, um, but uh, what you're going to hope for is, uh, well, th this I should have had a little later, but you know, we've had a lot of positive out outcomes. Uh, we've increased the public knowledge. There's new business models out there. Guys are changing their businesses, and a lot of good things are happening. Increased donations because people liked what we're doing. Increased opportunities to apply for grants, and the community likes us more. Uh, but how? Well, when you create a community event, try to find an issue where people can make a difference if you tell them there's a problem. Don't bother with, a, with an event that's just going to leave people hopeless. Try to frame it in a way where come learn and you can take your information and make a difference. That helps. Find experts in your region. Hopefully you don't have to fly people in from the West Coast. Big difference. 
Um, and then, so you think of the idea, you find a speaker, then wrap that idea up into a package and go talk to your friends. Go get co-sponsors, organizations, all of them, garden clubs, everything. And then get them to sign on. Because what you're really doing is you're getting them to sign on with their email list and their contacts and their influences. So, I mean, don't try to run a program on your own. Bring in a lot of organizers. Um, and like I mentioned before, there's so much good expert information. Use it to tell your story. Um, and an important thing with, with press and media, there's two types of media. There's the article writers, and then there's the community calendar people. So you need to create a blurb that's short for the community calendar. Then you need to create longer press stories and all that stuff. Um, and a lot of people wonder how much should you email, how much should you be in touch with people. I do it like two months out, two weeks, one week, four days, and the day before. And it works. It really helps. And people have come to me and said, thank you for the extra reminders. I've been meaning to come. Um, and then when you're running the events, uh, register everybody, but keep it simple. I would collect really affiliation, email, maybe a zip code if you're really curious. But don't bother with all the addresses and all that stuff unless you really think you need to mail stuff out. During the event, pay attention to who's there. Your event is, it, you're having an event so you could see who's out there to follow up with, to work with after that. Who said, oh, I mean, I've had interesting conversations with people after. Some people on the board of uh, pesticide companies have been there. Uh, some people investing in Monsanto earlier that day have just said, oh my gosh, I'm investing in that. You know, and they've made major changes, important people too. And then consider, it's not about who comes, it's about uh, people hearing it. So that even though the press didn't come, they still read your release, they know the topics out there. So this is what it's all about. We're trying hard, it's for the kids, and thank you very much for having me here. I have to tell you that, you know, Jeff is too modest for what he did and what Christy did, but from that first organic lawn care talk where there were 100, maybe 100, 110 primarily ladies in the audience for a morning. Within 10 months, the town of Greenwich had public policy prohibiting pesticides on all playing fields and public parks. So Audubon, Greenwich, Connecticut, whatever, it was the catalyst to make that happen. The right people were in the room, the right message was put out there. Uh, one of the people happened to be, uh, one of the women happened to be on the board of selectmen. And that discussion left that room that day and fast track through the public sector to make it a policy that all 75 acres of their playing fields and places where children play now became pesticide free. So one event, well planned, well targeted, ended up in a dramatic result in a very short time. Our last speaker is gonna tie this together, um, Sylvia Browdy. She's like, how, how can I describe it? She's like the great mother bird that spreads her wing <laughs> and brings us all together. She is the resource. She is there providing support, providing everything that Toxics Action Center can bring to bear. And she's everywhere. She's here, she's there, she's everywhere. Whenever these issues of toxics come up, Sylvia is there to fall back on. Uh, let's see, her formal bio. Sylvia is the organizing director for Toxics Action Center. She oversees Toxics Action's community organizing program, New England Wide. Working on the ground with communities focused on reducing pesticide use, cleaning up hazardous waste sites, shutting down dirty and dangerous waste facilities and power plants, and promoting clean water, safe energy, and zero waste. Recently, she played a critical role in efforts to shut down an 86-year-old coal plant in Massachusetts and prevent a new incinerator ash landfill in Connecticut. She also worked recently with Green Cape to pass an organic land care policy in Wellfleet, Massachusetts. Sylvia serves on the advisory committee to the Administrative Council for the Massachusetts Toxic Use Reduction Act. With that, welcome Sylvia.
this just isn't popping up with the you same make it work. way to uh, kick it into. Yeah, that's what I was going to. Yeah, that's true. I don't need to convince anyone. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Chip. Um, I'm always inviting Chip to come speak at Toxic Action Center's conferences. And so it's really wonderful to be a part of this panel with the other panelists. Um, and just an honor to be speaking at this amazing conference this year. Um, so again, my name's Sylvia Brody. I work as the organizing director for Toxic Action Center. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our work to reduce pesticides and harmful fertilizers in New England and then give some tips for planning winning campaigns to pass organic policies that we at Toxics Action Center have learned over many years of helping community groups run local campaigns to tackle environmental issues. Um, so, that was actually my next, my next slide. So I'll talk, a, I'll talk a little bit about Toxics Action Center and who we are. Um, about our work in Maine and on Cape Cod, and then I'll give some, some principles for planning, uh, planning a winning campaign. Um, at Toxics Action Center, we, um, we start our uh, work with the core belief that everyone deserves to breathe clean air, drink clean water, live in a healthy community, that our government should operate responsibly and democratically, and um, in that our community should be sustainable. And so our, our mission is to work to make those rights a reality by organizing side-by-side -side communities that are facing toxic threats and training groups in the skills and know-how that they need to win. And, um, and so we've been doing this work now for 25 years. We've worked with more than 700 communities New England-wide, representing somewhere around more than 10,000 individuals that we've directly trained and worked alongside. And our work really springs out of a tragedy in Woburn, Massachusetts, several decades ago. I don't know if people have read A Civil Action, seen the movie, heard the story, but the story is of W.R. Grace and other companies dumping toxic chemicals into the ground. Um, that contamination led to more than a dozen children getting cancer, and many of those children died. And back um, when that was happening in Massachusetts, there, was a, there were a group of environmentalists who, I think, realized that in order to combat these toxic threats, not only do we need real knowledge and experts, but we also really need to build political power. And so that's why Toxics Action Center was started, to help communities build that political power and be able to take on big polluters. And that's really what this um, presentation will be about, because I tend to think that um, you know, the problem of pesticides being used in communities is a political problem. There's someone who could essentially press a button and stop people in your town, or at least stop the town from using pesticides on town-owned lands. And it, you know, it's all about figuring out how you are going to convince that person to just push that button that you're gonna protect health and safety in your community. So, um, so I guess um, what I would love to do now is talk a little bit about a couple of the campaigns that we're working on that I think are just most relevant to this. This is another photo of Cape Cod. We work really closely with Sue Phelan and others at Green Cape. And um, I think Green Cape's policy is really special because it is very explicit about not just banning toxic pesticides on town-owned lands in Wellfleet, but also banning synthetic fertilizers as well, um, which really takes advantage of, I think, one of the most critical environmental issues of concern on the Cape, which is water pollution and nutrient loading. Um, and so this victory, I think, did come out of a, over a decade of organizing and awareness raising by Green Cape. And people on the Cape were really primed by the um, NSTAR issue that Sue mentioned. The, the major electric utility in the state uh, planned to stop cutting and mowing and instead spray five herbicides along 150 miles of power lines ac all across the Cape. And um, people on the Cape were just very concerned about their drinking water. And so we've been, we're essentially running a three-year campaign with Green Cape to convince and start to abandon their plans to spray. Through that effort, all 15 towns did pass non-binding resolutions coming out against NSTAR's plans to spray pesticides. And so 
things were primed for real proactive action to go further to reduce pesticide use in towns all across the, t the Cape. And so the, the goal of this proactive effort, which I think we're sort of calling the Cape Cod, um, what is it, Healthy Lawns, Clean Waters campaign is one name that for it, is not just to, you know, we pass this policy in Wealthy, but it's also to get all 15 towns on the Cape to pass organic policies at the town level. Um, so so that's, that's our work on Cape Cod. Um, we're also doing a lot of work in Maine, and um, although we work New England wide, but we're doing a lot of work on this issue on passing local policies in Maine. And uh, Marcia Smith and others from Citizen for, Citizens for Green Camden couldn't be here today, but um, they um, several years ago passed a similar organic policy in Camden, received an EPA award for that work. Um, they'd been working really closely with Paul Tukey who has been using his film, The Chemical Reaction, as a real organizing tool, showing screenings all across the state of Maine and getting communities like Camden excited to reduce pesticide use in their towns. And um, uh, at the time, a couple years ago, Toxic Action Center was literally working with 11 communities across the state of Maine on pesticide-related issues at the local level. And so we saw, coming out of this work in Camden, that there was real momentum building to do this work and pass local policies. And so we pulled together a, a pesticide summit that actually brought together nearly 75 people from 25 different Maine communities for a day of networking and an opportunity to share strategies. And there were speakers sharing their stories from other states like um, New York and Connecticut at that meeting, and um, the meeting was really exciting because we decided to launch a statewide coalition to ban pesticides on school grounds across Maine, and um, ultimately uh, a bill was introduced, it was, it was gutted and passed, um, and was essentially IPM. So, so, so we lost that effort, but we're still working in Maine on this issue and um, really focusing in on, on convincing more and more communities to go pesticide-free on town-owned lands. And um, Scarborough passed a similar policy. Just this week, the town of Kennebunk passed a policy as well. And Tracy Konopinski, our main organizer, has been working with that group. Um, and she's here today. Um, so, so I guess now, um, now I want to just get into the part about building political power and how to pass a policy in your community. How, how many people here, by the way, do this work as volunteers? Okay, so that's a pretty significant number of people in the room. Um, I, you know, I, what I want to do now is just walk through some big picture principles for how we at Toxic Action Center think about planning winning campaigns and um, developing strategy. Um, so the first is to set achievable goals. Um, and so when you're setting your goals for what you want to accomplish, you want to differentiate your long-term goals, what you ultimately want to accomplish. This, these could be goals that might take you years to accomplish from your short-term goals, which are short steps you want to achieve along the way. And I just think this is so important. Groups that don't agree on their goals at the outset of their campaign can just fall apart. We've been working with a community group in Biddeford, Maine, who are concerned about a trash incinerator. Half of the group wants the incinerator to be shut down, the other half is pretty convinced they just want it to be moved to a different part of town. And years later, very little progress has been made. So if you're pulling together neighbors in your community to tackle this issue, you might want to ask yourself a few questions. You know, what is it that you want to accomplish? And then make sure you're, you come to total agreement, write down those goals, and stay focused on them. Um, Second principle is to choose the right decision maker. Um, I think this is all about the fact that we all have very limited time and resources. And so you want to choose exactly the right person who can give you what you want. Um, and it's not always totally intuitive. So on the, the NSTAR issue is, a, is actually a good one where companies that spray along rights of ways, whether they're railroad companies or electric utilities or the state highway department, all have to get their plan to manage vegetation approved by the secretary of the Department of Agriculture in Massachusetts. So you'd think that you might want to spend all of your time convincing that person to actually just deny the plan to spray pesticides and instead force the company to use organic, you know, cutting and mowing. Well, ultimately, um, in Massachusetts, that, that person is just never going to make that denial. So instead, we focused on actually 
convincing NSTAR directly to abandon their spring plan, that the um, short-term cost savings are just not worth the long-term liability of contaminating the Cape's drinking water. Um, and so I think the same, it's just sort of the same thing where if you are talking with the Department of Public Works in your town because they're the ones who manage, um, they're the ones who manage the land, but ultimately it's the town council or the board of health who would be putting the regulation in place, you may want to go directly to that decision maker. Um, so the third principle is to articulate your strategy. Um, this is just all about taking a step back and thinking through your theory for why you think you can win. This is your rationale for why you think your efforts will work. And I think this is all about how people just want to be on the winning team. And so you have to be able to explain to people in town why you actually think that you are poised to be able to win a victory. Um, our, you know, one strategy that we thought about on Cape Cod was convincing the Cape Cod Commission, which is sort of like the regional planning agency, to um, adopt a recommendation that all towns go organic on town lands. You know, so we thought as an example of a strategy that if we brought them the right information, training by Chip Osborne, some um, information about cost savings over time of going organic, um, and then also just the risk that fertilizers and pesticides pose to groundwater and surface water, um, along with you know, give, pushing on them in the media, giving them a media opportunity, and showing some public support on the issue that we could convince them to, to do that. Um, and so that would be the way I would describe a strategy if we were gonna go after the support of the Cape Cod Commission. Um, I'm gonna try to move through these last few ones pretty quickly, um, but this is uh, the fourth. It's all about securing the support of your community. Um, I really think democracy still works, and when, in most cases, <laughs> um, when your town is on your side, you are just much more likely to win. And so as you're working to gain the support of your community, you should think about demonstrating both quantity, so the number of people that are signing on to your effort, but also quality. Um, so the, the types of people who might be influential, the types of groups. And um, these are actually some photos of, I think it says no sportsmen, sportsmen against the dump or something like that in the upper corner. Um, on Cape Cod, we work to sign on nearly 200 businesses in support of our efforts to stop NSTAR spring plans. And we're now getting their support on the local organic policies as well. Um, all right, so, oh, and then I guess, I guess the one last thing here is that not only do you need to actually secure the support, but you need to be able to demonstrate that support to decision makers. So that means having something on paper or in the media that actually shows that the majority of the community is on your side. So I can sort of list off all of the things we did on the Cape so far. I mean, thousands of petition signatures, call-in days to NSTAR where hundreds of people called into the company, a um, hundred scientists and environmental health professionals signing on to a letter, 200 businesses endorsing the effort, all 15 towns passing non-binding resolutions, legislators who've been really vocal. There's sort of a whole menu of options. You should think about what might be influential in this case, especially if you're doing local policy work. It's actually usually easier to influence a local decision maker who's in your community. And, um, and then you want to go out and gather that support and then, and then show it very loudly. Um, all right, so build your group along the way. Uh, your group and your effort should be stronger when it finished than when it began. Um, and I think having a sizable group not only legitimizes your effort, but it also just gives you more time and resources, more people to help t you know, share the load. So there are just a lot of ways to do this. I just think this is all thinking about constantly how, you're, how you can bring new people in, new volunteers in support of your efforts. So things like holding open meetings, at regularly scheduled times can be really helpful so that people in the public know about the meetings and can join, having a sign-in sheet at all of your meetings so that you can capture those new names. Um, circulating a petition, even if you actually think it's not politically helpful, I think Suzanne mentioned this, it's so great for building your list. And so always make sure you're gathering an email and a phone number so that you can call on those people later and get them to help. Uh, and then we are, I know we're running pretty low on time, so I'm gonna wrap up really quickly. Um, I just have a couple more slides. Um, this is escalate your campaign over time. Um, and this is one thing we've, 
we've learned over many years at Toxic Action Center, you always want to ask for what you want nicely first before you storm the castle. You always kind of want to knock on the door. Um, and this is another thing that just saves you time and energy because it's possible that the decision maker in your town might just say, sure, we're really excited about this and we are going to go for it. Um, and if they don't, then you can sort of ramp up pressure little by little by little. And um, this is a press conference that we held here in Connecticut with um, Blumenthal when he was the Attorney General. And to get to this point where we were working to stop the trash agency in the state from building a new landfill, an incinerator ash landfill in Franklin, we had first gathered all of the support in the town of Franklin, then we'd gone to neighboring towns, then we worked all across the state, then we passed a bill through the House and the Senate, then, I mean, literally it was a year of organizing before we got to this point where we had a letter from the governor and Attorney General Blumenthal speaking with us and literally the very next day, the trash agency abandoned its plans. So I think it's all about um, ramping up little by little by little and this also just builds your credibility as well. Um, and I think the way to do this is to first make sure that you always approach the decision maker and ask them how they feel about the issue because then you could, that'll also help you tailor your strategy. This is all about messaging and crafting a message that is concise, compelling, consistent, and controls the issue. And I think um, in order to um, run an effective campaign, you just need to be able to tell your story in a way that is compelling. So ideally, you want to have a hero, you want to have a villain and a victim, and you want to be able to describe the problem that you're facing, what the solution is, and the action that needs to be taken to solve the problem. And, um, and then I guess the last principle I had was to evaluate as you go. So um, start, so, so I guess you should always be taking time to step back and evaluate your campaign plan periodically. So are you still on the right track to achieve your goals? Do you need to switch, tar switch targets or switch strategies to get back on track? And um, I think this is something that groups just don't do often enough. Um, so that, those are sort of my principles of winning campaigns. I want, Can you go back to the previous slide for a second? yeah, absolutely. These are some community groups and other organizations that we have worked with over the years. Um, one thing that I want to do, I guess the last thing I want to do is offer Toxics Action Centers help. So if you live here in New England, our staff are here and are happy to talk with you on the phone or literally travel out to your community to help you pass an organic policy for your town. And, um, you know, or tackle another pesticide issue. So. My contact information is on the very last slide. And I definitely urge you to get in touch. Take a look at our website. It's toxicsaction.org. And thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. organic garden and you know the respected conservationist and biologist Edward O. Wilson has said getting rid of lawns is a noble cause so I know we need some green lawns for baseball fields and a few other things but one of the things you know lawn mowers uh, are much dirtier than automobile engines they emit PAHs which are carcinogens they're noisy they're one of the leading causes of emergency room admissions and so on. So I was going for the whole loaf to get this landscape changed to, and by the way, one of the other things, and this is relevant to Connecticut, where the city of Lyme is, um, a book edited by Harvard, or written by Harvard Medical School professors, they don't have the proof yet, but they think the reduction in biodiversity, which to some extent is caused by the prevalence of lawns, is linked to the decline of, the, of animals that are predators to the mice that transmit Lyme disease. So 
just having green lawns in Greenwich is half a loaf. It's not a whole loaf. So, but I talked earlier to Nancy Alderman, and she said these people settle for a green lawn. So in terms of strategy, you all have much more experience than I do. Do you agree with Nancy? Should I go for the whole? So to go for the whole, I mean, to eliminate lawns? Yeah, now these are sophisticated people. This is Johns Hopkins Hospital, the lawn in front of Johns Hopkins Hospital. Well, there's certainly, I mean, I'll speak, and then everybody else can. I mean, there's certainly, it, lawns cover an area the size of the state of Nebraska. Right. Golf course is the size of the state of Connecticut. Then add all your public parks and other green spaces. I don't think it's ever realistic to tell everybody that they, no one can ever have a lawn anymore, but certainly there is too much lawn and those of us, I know I can speak for Sarah, that we're always advocating turf grass alternatives. But I think where we're going with this is that there is grass that will remain uh, for one reason or another, whether it's someone's little 3,000 square foot patch of lawn that they can put a lounge chair and sit down and enjoy it, whether it's the golf course, whether it's a playing field for children or just a passive park where people can walk through, the goal in my mind, has to be, yes, reduce and eliminate uh, where appropriate, but learn how to manage in a non-chemical way those patches of grass that will remain in society. Will it? Oh, go ahead. From a language standpoint? Got to flip the switch. Um, one way we, we start to talk about it is reduce your, reduce your lawn to what you absolutely need so that everybody can think about what that means to them in their situation. Like a push mower, if you could just... Not going to cause any problem. Well, it seems like, I don't know if this is working, but it seems like um, one question is, is that the right goal? Um, and another question is, like Suzanne said, how do, you how do you message it? What's the message and the story that you tell? And if you're trying to figure out if it's the right message or the right goal, I think a good test is could you tell, you know, could you say a sentence about what you're doing and the majority of people in town would, would support you and know what you're talking about. And if you don't think you could get the majority of, of support by explaining your story to people in town, then you might try to change it a little bit because it's just going to be hard to make progress if you, you know, I think you could seem kind of marginalized if you, if you can't, you know, if you can't get people to join you. These are relatively sophisticated people at Johns Hopkins. We're behind New England, though. So my suggestion would be don't say reduce the amount of lawn. Say let's increase the amount of native species ah, yes. or increase the number of flowers or increase the number of edible you know, bushes. And so don't even talk about it. And there may or may not be some amount of lawn required if you want to have a path you're walking through or something, but don't even talk about reducing, you just talk about increasing the diversity or <laughs> enhancing it, making it more beautiful. I mean, just you just say, we'll make it more beautiful and then you can reduce the size of the lawn and no one will argue with you. you know? Okay, one more, I'm sorry. The National Park Service project is to take areas that historically were in, in a couple of the parks, one of the parks that historically was a clear and returning it that way, getting rid of the grass that somebody 30 years ago under that model put there, when now we're looking at you know, like 10 acres of grass that's just being mown every seven days and saying, you know, bringing back biodiversity in that region and on that piece of property. So that really is a big focus moving forward. All right, sorry, one more quick question. I'm sorry for asking more than one. The cost of an organic landscape, as opposed to, you said that an organic lawn in the long haul is less money. An organic native plant garden, is that about the same cost, more or less? Well, a native planting, would it, it, it all depends on how you establish it to determine what that cost up front would be. Uh, certainly, the you know it all depends. I mean, you can have a... You know, a lawn like, like Sarah and I work with at Nova that is low mow, no fertility. So you will never buy a bag of fertilizer if you allow us to seed clover through it. Um, you know, you will never buy a bag of fertilizer. You return your grass clippings, you pick one of the lower mow species, uh, no fertilizer, minimal mowing, becomes very cost effective. Uh, it all depends on the cultural intensity or that level of management that you're after. So the cultural intensity for a sports field is very different than that 
than that mo, no, no, no mow lawn. So the, the low mow, no mow lawn could be pretty cost comparative to, you know, sort of that, you know, that natural wildflower site. Of course, the higher managed, you know, to meet those higher expectations um, always will cost more than, you know, than that. Yes. So just to sort of add to what you were saying, you know, when the folks were trying to work on this stuff in Quebec, um, you know, they did these kind of psychological studies with people about, you know, the concept of the great American or Canadian lawn. And I think something that can be really novel when you're having some of these events is just introducing new ideas of aesthetics, almost like a new fashion, a new idea. So, um, you know, we're going to be talking about things like, you know, meadow um, gardens. So having, you know, like kind of what you were talking about, the tall grasses with flowers. And um, like a medicinal um, ground covers, you know, that could be like another new aesthetic fashion. And certainly there's a woman in Needham even where, where Susan and I live who's um, helping people do like food in her front lawn, in their front lawns instead of um, the chemicals. So like all these ideas when you can kind of gently weave in ideas of sustainability, ideas of, you know, hey, go, go back to the push mowers and, you know, show some push mowers or, you know, do a dandelion um, event, dandelion festival, dandelion tea, the, you know, dandelion tinctures and all these things. It's not that everybody's going to buy into it. I mean, like, if you're in a rural area like New Hampshire, where I was, you know, you're going to get people who are into that. If you're in, you know, maybe Greenwich, Connecticut, it, it might be a bit of a, a push, but, you know, you might be able to at least pick some mint out of your garden and put in clover in your tea, you know, little things like that. Um, it's, it's, it's nice to weave that into the messaging and then people eventually will learn over time these things. So that's just my thoughts. Um, I live in Needham and we have a uh, town meeting um, a warrant article and I'm beginning to believe that maybe we're asking, giving too much information in what we're asking the town to do. Um, several, many of us want to have the town organically manage their um, uh, conservation land and the, uh, on all public land. Um, and several people know that b the berms between the um, road and the sidewalk are not owned by the residents. So in a full um, uh, um, flush of tell people what you're really saying, um, we included berms as a public land, which will probably s surprise many people. Um, and I don't know if um, giving them that um, uh, information will derail the idea of going organic as a, um, a town management skill. Do you have opinions? Oh, one selectman said that if we um, included berms, people would say that the town then should maintain the berms. Mm. That was actually from the town manager. Sarah, do you know anything about berms? I, I, I would guess that you're right, it will cause you problems. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, an issue that a lot of people might not worry too much about will become personal for every single person in town. So. Um, I, yeah, I think tactically you probably should take that out. But they still own it and they still could tell people they can't put pesticides on it if you're talking about town land, but I wouldn't pick it, I wouldn't single it out. Because if you single it out, you may give the impression that now you're expecting a greater workload from a municipal department that is already overtaxed, <laughs> short of budget, short of manpower, and they would see that, uh, speaking as an elected public official that manages a department that's involved in land care, that would be the first thing that the decision makers would look at, that uh, how can I get behind this? Because potentially that's going to put me behind the eight ball and I can't respond. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for your presentation. It's extremely helpful for us community activists to learn what you've done. And my question really is for Chip. Our community is fairly progressive and they will say, well, you're going to put all these lawn care people out of business. Do you have any figures that shows how people can make money doing organic lawn care 
versus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of figures, um, you know, and, and, and Sarah will back me up on this. In 2008, there was market research done. Uh, it, it's done every four years uh, around the landscape industry. And uh, at that time, the survey was based on people's uh, perception of their lawn care strategies based on the negative environmental effects of these lawn care products. Interesting that it was not environmental and human health. So if human health had been brought into this equation, these numbers that I'm going to give you would be that much higher. At that time, 75 million households in the United States did something with their lawn and garden. 3% did it organically, but up to 28% would gladly do it your, your, them organically if they were doing it yourself or, or if they had a service provider that they had the confidence that could do it for them in a professional way. So, you know, Sarah's efforts and the efforts of Connecticut and Nova, Massachusetts um, have been to educate landscapers. So, but yes, the organic landscape industry is growing. It is profitable. Uh, we have new technology from the product side now where we can deliver nitrogen in very low rates at a very cost-effective way and meet the same high expectations the conventional industries put out there. Uh, I don't believe they are. They're in some of the PowerPoints that I give when I, when I, when I talk about the economics of organics, but sure, you can contact me. I'll, I'll provide you with that information. I just want to say one quick thing. It's really important that, um, that these landscapers get the right training. There's, a, there's training organizations out there that don't do it right. You need NOFA or you need Chip Osborne. We brought him down to New Jersey twice, and it was amazing to see people who came in landscapes are skeptical, um, leaving, wow, I'm really a believer now. And we were comfortable with that because we knew he's, he's truly teaching the right thing. So that's important if you take on an effort like that. And uh, oh, I'll just say one thing. I was uh, at a talk earlier this week, and an organic landscaper in Newton came up to me, and he, he has a company called Newton Organic Lawns, I think. He says he can't take any more customers. He's completely booked, and he's thinking he should maybe start a program training people how to do organic lawns because the demand is so high, and the people who do it are, you know, can barely meet the demand. So, I, I have a question to, I guess, all of you. Um, my name is Amy Joyce. I'm with Healthy Communities Project in Mo uh, Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, and I've worked for quite a few years with Chip and Warren Porter. Um, and we've been working at the municipal, the school district, and the residential level. Um, and in general, I come out here because I just feel so much better being in a climate where people are willing to even listen <laughs> in New England versus uh, the state of Wisconsin. Um, and my question really involves what your experiences have been in relation to how you've seen the right to know movement progress throughout what you've done. Because I, would f I think it's safe to say we're quite a few years behind overall in the Midwest on this issue. And my sense is that there's a very direct correlation between getting local governments to provide that, that mechanism, if you will, of right to know uh, when pesticides are applied, by whom, what the material safety data sheets are, are and are they available to residents, um, do school districts notify parents in advance of every application of any pesticide on school grounds. When you, when you see those uh, mechanisms being put in place and all of a sudden those bodies of of residents and parents begin to have that information available to them in an easy way, that to me is really what I foresee to be the ticket in, in moving, shifting that paradigm because it's going to, I think it's going to cause all of those people or far more people to be able to then say, hey, I'm not cool with this. And, and who's making these decisions? And how did you get to make that decision? Um, so I'm really curious, because that's where I'm sitting right now in our work, is uh, you know, I'm, I'm a board meeting away of getting the village of Whitefish Bay to put that mechanism in place. Um, because we have a different village manager, and it's just a matter of how, how willing he is to do it. 
Um, so I'm, I'd love to hear your feedback to see how you feel about that particular issue. Um, uh, my, I have a comment. I think that initially it has an impact, but then it goes down into the noise for people. And I think about the writing on a cigarette package, saying that it's you know it's a horrible warnings, but that doesn't stop people. When it first came out, it was kind of shocking. But I think within a couple of weeks, if you were used to it, you just ignored it. So having a kind of an automated message, I'm not sure. I'll tell you, in Massachusetts, we don't have a neighborhood notification law. And we do have, in 2000, we passed a, a Children and Families Protection Act, which gov governed pesticide use in schools. And if the school uses a pesticide, uh, except for a mi microbial, they're allowed to use those, they, they need to, supposed to send notifications home. Most schools don't use it because of the financial cost of having to send a flyer to thousands of people. So it's a deterrent because of the cost, not so much. I mean, we're working on email last month. Right, right. Kind of that that's a, a cost issue. Right. So I think that um, it will have an effect, but in, in Massachusetts, which I think is one of the things that has caused a lot of movement, is that to pass this law, I don't know if you were involved, that was about 15 years ago, there was a lot of um, grassroots effort to, to get out, go out and get signatures to support it. So there was, people were hearing about it, pesticides as an issue, and then um, there was kind of a cascade effect with Patty Wood came in and spoke, and then, um, and then uh, Ellie Goldberg and Newton got started, and it kind of cascaded, and, then, I, and then, then Chip and Pat and Barblehead, and then I heard them talk, and I did Stumping and, and Wellesley, so there was all these little sparks lighting up, and when I did it, a bunch of people came through town and saw our flyers, and I trained 20 towns who all wanted to do it. So the information got, got picked up and passed around, but it wasn't a notification law. So there, you do want to get that idea in front of people repeatedly, but not necessarily in a way that they're, like, I think the yellow flags, do you guys have yellow flags? When they apply a pesticide, do they have to put a yellow flag up? We have white flags with, with red lettering and box. Oh, okay, so that's on every lawn and it says, point, you know, Children crossed out. Nobody pays attention to it anymore. I mean, I, I feel, you. I know. I feel like I should have a series of photos of like there was a lemonade stand right next to a sign just in my neighborhood, and I thought they aren't seeing that anymore. It's a desensitizing. Exactly. So you don't want to desensitize people. You want the message to come from different places, instead of the same place all the time. And I guess my one quick comment, uh, my one quick thought on that is that if your town manager is really excited to do it and thinks it's going to be really helpful, then go ahead and have him, move, him or her move it forward. Don't say, don't do that, that's not helpful, that might be really discouraging for a potential, you know, real ally in your efforts. Um, on the other hand, it's, I'm guessing it's not your overall goal, your long-term goal, it's not about notification, it may be about, you know, curbing pesticide use, banning pesticide use, and having notification be a part of it. But, um, you know, it, it, kind of like what happened in Maine, where now there's, you know, there's IPM in Maine. It's going to be much harder to get an organic policy passed. I, feel, I would hate to have it be this big, long campaign that you worked on. People feel like they accomplished something, and everybody who is concerned about pesticides won something. So why would you go even further and, and push for some sort of ban? And so um, there's a lot of people who talk about the women's rights movement and the Equal Rights Amendment in the same way. There's some sort of weaker thing that passed instead. And so um, it's going to be, so, it'd be so much harder to get the original bill passed again. Um, I didn't think to ask Patty Wood before she left, but maybe some of you know about a, a, a conference that was held in Marblehead a few years ago. Um, to alert people to the hazards that pesticides pose for animals. Sometimes you can't move people on childhood protection, but you can move them if they're animal advocates. Um, does, that, is that a strategy that you would consider? Yeah, I think that was very successful. They actually, I think they had a pet parade 
mm -hmm. as part of this, and then, then a talk? What, you would yeah, the original one was Dr. Diana Post, uh, who is the executive director of the Rachel Carson Council in Silver Spring, Maryland. And she came up, and we had an evening, and she is a veterinarian. Uh, so I did, you know, I, I talked on, on what I talk on, the Pesticide 101, and, and how we can do it without it. And she talked about that issue from the veterinarian perspective and what, you know, veterinarians, and I've worked with several vets on, on panels. And that's a very real way, because you can reach a lot of young mothers through children, or young, I, I'll say young mothers and grandmothers, because when I do garden clubs, it's a lot grandmothers, but they go right out and call their daughters and say, we got to talk about what's happening here. So, you know, that's very effective, but for some people, you know, the pet is, is the trigger. And, you know, we heard, um, well, if anybody was in the workshop, uh, you know, this morning with the, um, you know, with our Connecticut state senator, um, you know, his, his was a dog issue. His dog died from running on a golf course. I have a dog issue. I killed two English Springer Spaniels because they hung around my greenhouse. Where I was, I used to be a huge pesticide user. I used pesticides for 25 years because that's what I was taught in my commercial greenhouse. Spray, spray, spray every seven to 10 days. But I had two dogs and they lived under the benches where all this stuff ran down there. So yeah, pets are a very powerful trigger um, you, you know, for a lot of people. <coughs> I'll come back. I just got First of all, thank you very much to all of you for coming to speak. Um, I'm Maxwell Kushner Lenhoff, uh, current senior chemistry major here at Yale. I'm here with Hody Nemus. Uh, both of us are part of the Yale Student Environmental Coalition, which co sponsored this conference. So thank you very much. My question for you guys is that we're planning a camp, we've actually started a campaign and have a, had a couple of uh, meetings with. Uh, administrators in the Office of Sustainability and also the Office of Grounds Management. We're trying to transition the university, which currently has uh, an integrated pest management policy on the campus and traditional pesticides out on the IM fields, which is fairly surprising considering that we're all in this building, which is obviously, you know, an amazing environmental achievement just several miles down the way. Uh, you know, not, not such an environmental achievement, especially from what we've been discussing. I was wondering what you would recommend as a first step in trying to get a university that cares very much about the way that their lawns look and about the fact that they have such a history of using, of doing things a certain way. Uh, would it be a pilot po project in one of the residential colleges or what sort of thing could you see as, as an incremental step we could ask for as the first thing in this campaign? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, you, you, you absolutely have to do that. Yeah, Harvard, uh, well, Harvard's just doing, Harvard has a pilot project. They're not managing all 50 acres organically. Um, you know, so they, uh, I've worked with, you know, there was a University of Colorado at Boulder, CU, you know, in downtown Boulder. Uh, the discussion was, arose with students. The student population brought that discussion to the table. Uh, I ended up going out there as a consultant working with the city of Boulder and the university. Uh, and after talking to the ground staff, we, we had all kinds of decision makers in the pipeline, right down to the guys that did it. Uh, the university published a paper saying that within five years, the entire campus will be 100% pesticide free based on programs that I'd worked with to put in place. Compost tea is now being injected through irrigation lines, you know, and all that. But it began with the students. Tufts University up in Medford, Mass., right outside of Boston. It began with the students. That's an organic campus. So that's really, you know, what happened. You are very powerful. You are the consumers of this university. And you are the ones that they listen to. They would be less likely to listen to any one of us than they would to listen to you. Mm -hmm. So you are a very powerful, you know, powerful voice. And when you raise that question, believe me, they listen. And I just wanted to add that the three things that whether it's state legislation or universities or town, the three kind of themes that I hear and I use over and over is that it's safer, it's uh, effective, and it's cost effective. So it's safer, it works, and it's cost effective. So if you can proactively bring them justification for all three of those, then you'll kind of um, avoid the questions that you'll get. Okay, well, but is it gonna cost us more? Okay, yeah, but is it gonna work? 
okay, but is it really bad? So instead of waiting for those questions, you can get examples, you know, we're, we're all happy to provide that too, of, of how you can frame all three of those issues. And I, I guess, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I was just mm -hmm. gonna say to take Sylvie's advice, I don't know if you've talked to them yet, but my experience in working with DPWs is they did not want me to tell them how to do their job. And, and they were right, I don't, I'm not a landscaper. So to, to try to uh, try your first approach nicely and, and see if they're interested, because if they're interested in the topic and they own it, it'll succeed. And if they're not interested and they don't own it, it will fail. So, and then they will only do it if they're made to do it, which if you can avoid going down that route, you're gonna, everyone would be happier. But as Sylvia will say, sometimes you have to go down that route. You have to like get the trustees to, and you know, tell them they have to do it, but. The real secret is to plant the seeds and you approach the subject and then let them think that it was their idea. Right, <laughs> that's a, that's a. you do that instant bias, all yeah. of a sudden, it's not you telling them what to do, but you plant the seed, you nurture that seed for appropriate discussion, then all of a sudden it's somewhere in some room and the door's closed, all of a sudden they think it is their idea and then they grab it in front of them because that ownership. And you right, have to take and that's Absolutely. and that's um that's a classic hero strategy. I tend to think that there are three different kinds of strategies when you're work, you know, when you're targeting a decision maker and convincing them to make a decision. There's hero where the person agrees with you on the issue or is somewhere close and um, you know is ready to do the right thing and especially you know makes it a little bit sweeter if they can get some good PR out of it. There's cover where the decision maker is you know probably agrees with you on the issue but there's something standing in the way of the person or the decision maker to make a public stand and then there's pressure where the decision maker doesn't really agree with you on the issue. Everyone's probably been in this situation and you have to use a lot of grassroots pressure, media pressure, petition signatures, whatever it takes to move that decision maker to come over on your side. And so I think um, Yale has done a lot. And they, I think that um, the campus prides itself, I went to college here, the campus prides itself on being green. So giving them every opportunity, working from the inside, to talk, you know, talking to the people who probably are the right decision makers to do the right thing before you actually have a real presence in a public campaign on campus would probably be the smart thing. It might just get the campus to move, you know, might get the school to move more quickly, actually. But at the same time, you do want to be ready to actually demonstrate that you have widespread public support. And um, I'm, I'm interested in talking more about this after the session's over.